Okay, welcome to your tap, chapter 2 uh, introductory video. In this chapter, we're basically going to be talking about the building blocks of matter. So here are your learning goals once again, just like chapter 1. Um, you do have to get a feel for the, for the major scientific experiments, and, and we'll go through a couple of those right here. We'll talk about some more of them in class. You need to start learning how to write chemical notations, so looking at chemical symbols and equations. Um, start to get a feel for properties of the elements and understanding the arrangement of the periodic table. A lot of you that had some of these, you know, uh, had chemistry in high school will, will be familiar with a lot of this. Um, the harder part of the chapter will be, you know, the introduction. We do this early on here is the introduction of the mole and the inner conversion between mass, moles, molar mass, and number of particles. I like to spend a good amount of time on that in class so that that's why I want to get some of this fundamental stuff out of the way so we can spend a lot of time on this right here in class because that's important and it often presents some problems. We'll also do a, a little involved calculation with isotopic abundances. Here's your chapter outline and you notice basically we got five main sections that we're covering. The last section, mass spectroscopy, isotope abundance and molar mass, don't worry about that. Um, read it for your knowledge, for your interest, but that's not something I'm going to cover in class and you're not going to be responsible for it on any exam material. So we're going to start off talking about J.J. Thompson's experiment. And he was basically looking at uh, what's called these cathode tubes, if you will. And what he has here is a cathode. And what this is right here is different types of metal he can put here. And you'll learn about electrochemistry and actually in the very end of Gen Ken 2. But for the most part here, we have basically, you know, a high voltage source with negatively and positively charged poles. And what he, and he had magnets here. And uh, magnets, of course, have poles, north and south poles. Um, and then what we have over here is a, a f kind of phosphorescent coating. So this is basically a screen that shows you an image. It's very similar to the way an x-ray works or if you've been... A photographer and you ever shot film photography the way you would get exposure of of a film so what happens there is then you know if an electrically charged type particle or some sort of radioactivity were to hit this screen it would fluoresce and you'd be able to see where it's hitting so what he was able to do was to take the cathode and he can use different types of material here different types of metal and what he noticed was that there seemed to be a particle that was produced of some sort that was attracted, um, if you will, towards the positively charged plate, which led him to understand because at this point we knew the law of charges in that, and that is that opposites attract and like charges repel. So he concluded that this particle, whatever it was, was detected here, was negatively charged. And it didn't matter what type of metal he used here, he saw the same thing. And he always saw a constant mass to charge ratio. It never changed. So if you will, effectively, let's say the charge in one case was double of what it was in the previous experiment, well, the mass would also be double. So the ratio remained constant. So Dom Thompson discovered what we consider now and call the electron. Now Millikan is one of my favorite experiments. It's an interesting experiment, and um, what he did here is he took oil droplets, introduced them, and this is just an atomizer, meaning you're producing incredibly small droplets of oil. And of course, at this point, we know about Newton's laws, and we also know about some of the electricity laws. And I also mentioned, just mentioned to you the law of charges. But we know from Newton's laws that, in fact, that as a particle... You know, it falls, right? It falls at a certain acceleration. We got, you know, we know about the laws. Force equals mass times acceleration, things like that. Uh, uh, gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Acceleration due to gravity. All of this stuff is known. So Millikan does is he is able to, if you notice here, we have a um, positive charged plate right here. So... What he does is he uses x-rays right here to ionize the particles. So as a result, now these particles um, become charged. And they're going to fall under the force of gravity. 
but they're also effectively going to be attracted if they're negatively charged towards this positive plate here as they fall. So actually by controlling um, the electric field, he can control the rate at which it was dropping. And he was therefore able to determine whatever the charge was because he knew the rate it would, which it should fall based on gravity. And then he was able to control and measure how fast it was actually falling, therefore from that be able to get the charge. And as I told you, we already knew what the charge to mass ratio was. So that's like kind of knowing what x over y is equal to. If you know what x over y is equal to 10, and then Millikan comes along and he is able to tell you what one of those is. He was able to tell us what the charge is. So I should use, you know, the actual x would be charge and y is mass. And therefore he was able to determine from the those combination of these two experiments we'll be able to get the charge and mass of an electron. So Thompson, this is Thompson without a P, that's the way his name is spelt, comes up with a model for the atom now. Now you all know from taking chemistry in high school, or at least some sort of physical science in high school, that um, this model is no longer very accurate and accepted. But what his model was, was that we had this positively charged sphere, if you will. Kind of the positive charge is distributed throughout the sphere, and then you had these particles in there that were these electrons, right? They're negatively charged. Because at this point, the proton has not, not been discovered. We knew that there had to be positive charge because matter was neutral. Matter didn't just attract to a positively charged plate, right? So it's neutral, therefore we knew there had to be positive charge. We came up with this idea that the sphere is positively charged and the negative electrons are embedded in that sphere. I've personally never had plum pudding, so some of you might be able to relate to why this is called the plum pudding model. So Rutherford, I'm um, sorry, before we go to Rutherford, a couple other things are going along on right now, historically. Um, radioactivity is discovered. And Henry Becquerel in 1896 realized somewhat serendipitously that some materials produce this kind of invisible radiation. Basically, the story goes that he was storing, like, to make a long story short, some uranium in like this, this uh, lab drawer. And in that same drawer, he had some film, just like I talked about before with these experiments here, this phosphorescent type screen, some sort of film that, um, that when exposed to radiation or charged particles, um, develops, if you will, or produces an image. And he took out the film and noticed it was exposed. And he said, oh, well, someone must have obviously let some light in. So he basically put some new film in the drawer, and, 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 and so make a long story short, he eventually realized that the uranium he was storing in the drawer was giving off some sort of energy and radiation that was exposing the film. And some of the radioactivity that we see produced are things like beta particles and alpha particles. There are only two types um, of the many types of radiation and particles that can be produced. Gamma radiation is another one. That is actually a a uh, electromagnetic radiation where these two are actually particles. Um, so that becomes important because as we move on to the next experiment, Rutherford's experiment, so he's going to test the plum pudding model. So basically he's going to take a gold piece of foil and he's going to pound this incredibly thin. He wants to test this and I want you to read this in your textbook. We're going to talk about the results of this experiment um, in class because this is a groundbreaking experiment. Um, but he's going to use an alpha metal coat, type of material that gives off alpha particles. And an alpha particle, if you go back and look at this, has a plus two charge. And it has a mass of, basic, it's basically an alpha particle is equivalent to two protons and two neutrons. It's equivalent to a helium nucleus, but we haven't talked about that notation yet, so I'm not going to tell you that. But that's what an alpha particle is equivalent to. And most of the time, when he bombarded this piece of thin gold foil with alpha particles, they went right through. In fact, most of them. It was only something like 1 in 8,000 that did something else. And that's what I want you to read and talk about and the conclusions that come from that. We'll talk about that in class. Now I want to introduce this concept of atomic mass units. And this is pretty straightforward. Really, It really is just equal to 1 12th 
of a carbon atom. And it was just a convention that was decided on. Realize we do this a lot in science. We decide on certain conventions that are going to make things fairly simple for us to um, work with. And that's why we do it. Not much different than, we'll talk about later, the mole. Not much different than we decided, hey, we want to come up with some sort of unit that had multiple numbers in it. We came up with a dozen. Okay? It's very similar to this. So, carbon would use as a standard quite a bit, actually. And it was decided that 1 AMU would simply be 1 12th the mass of carbon. Now, carbon contains... Um, most carbon, we'll have to talk about isotopes later, six protons and six nu neutrons, so it has 12 AMUs is the idea. So it effectively, each proton is an AMU and each nu neutron is an AMU. That's where you're getting this, this unit of mass of 12 AMUs, and that's a mass of one carbon atom. And an AMU is equivalent to a Dalton. That's something you'll get exposed to um, probably when you take biochemistry. So here's your subatomic particles now. You'll notice that a proton, I mean a neutron and a proton, both are about 1 AMU. In fact, to two significant figures, which we did in chapter 1, two significant figures, they're both 1 AMU. That's where this mass number comes from. In general, it's 1. The electron is so small that we'd be given a mass number of 0, and it really doesn't factor in much at all to the total mass of an atom. So you can see now... Um, here's your charges. These are actual charges over here in units of coulombs, which is a physics charge. But we actually use kind of a relative charge. These two are equivalent, just opposite in sign. So we just call them plus, minus, and minus one proton electron. And neutron actually has no charge. So I want you also now to uh, read your book and, and uh, come up with a an idea of what an isotope is. You might know already, but if not, you know, come up with a definition of isotope and, isotope and come to class ready to talk about that. Now I want to talk to you about how we notate um, basically nuclides. And we can have different isotopes we would notate this way um, and different elements we notate this way. So what this represents here is the actual symbol. Okay, so there is no element X, so if we wanted to use carbon, that would be the symbol. The top number is known as the mass number, and it's the total number of nucleons, which are protons and neutrons, in the nucleus. The atomic number is just the number of protons, and that is Z down here. So, for what we said before, where we had carbon, which had six protons and six neutrons, would be notated like this. And of course, a minus Z equals the number of neutrons. Because obviously this is the total of neutrons and protons. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's how we notate these nuclides. Now the periodic table is something you need to start getting familiar with. Um, Mendeleev gets most of the credit for developing the periodic table, and there was another scientist involved in it at the same time, but he was kind of beat to the punch by Mendeleev, and I can never remember his name, unfortunately. Um, but uh, originally in his periodic table, they ordered the elements by increasing atomic mass, so he figured, okay, I'll arrange them across the page from left to right as the mass increases. Protons weren't discovered at this point. And he put elements in columns based upon similar chemical figure, physical properties. So if something had a greater mass than something to the left of it, but had very similar properties to something to the left, he would put it under it rather than keep going across. Um, so what you wind up with is grouping of things that had similar properties. And he left spaces open for elements not yet discovered. And in some cases, he even predicted, hey, we don't know of anything in this particular space right here, but I'm predicting we're actually going to find an element that's going to fit right in here, and I can even tell you some of the characteristics of that. And he was actually pretty spot on with a couple of his predictions. In the modern periodic table, um, the elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number because we know now that is the better way of doing it because that's what really determines the physical and chemical properties, not the mass in itself. The mass plays a role, but of course the mass increases with the, with the number of protons. So 
which is the atomic number. Remember, this is the number of protons. That is the signature of an element. If something has six protons, it is carbon, no exceptions. If it's carbon, it has six protons, no exceptions. Electrons and neutrons can vary. Protons cannot for a given element. I said this already. Uh, horizontal rows you have, your periods, and then you've got the vertical columns, known as families. Um, and they'll have some names to those that you'll need to get familiar with. And if most of you probably know these already, but if not, you'll need to memorize them. Alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, halogens, and your noble gases. Um, of course, here is the modern periodic table. And you'll notice now it's arranged in order of increasing atomic number. One, two, three, Oops, four, five, six, and so forth. Now, what we're saying here is that these right here have similar properties. That's why they're grouped together. And these right here have similar properties, and that's why they're grouped together. Um, what you'll notice is the different coloring here, and um, this kind of beigey color. These are all metals. The green ones, these are metalloids somewhat in between metals and nonmetals, and the blue ones, of course. These are all nonmetals, includes hydrogen also. These are known as our representative elements. All of these are representative elements. Here, 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 and all of these are represent. These are our transition elements. Whoops, went too far there. These guys right here are transition elements, right? These are often called our inner transition elements. You've got your lanthanide and actinide series here. So you need to get familiar with some of these things. Um, metals you must think about as conducting electricity, conducting heat, being malleable, ductile, which means we can make them into sheets, pull them into wires. Um, metalloids will be somewhat in between that and nonmetals, which would be either solids, liquids, or gases. Most metals are solids. Mercury is an exception. Nonmetals could be any of those things. They don't really conduct electricity. Um, so metalloids would be something in between that. And here's, I was drawing this point before, so we don't need to talk about that. I already went back and notated this. One thing we'll learn more about in, in Chapter 3 is this idea of these common charges that elements take on when they form ions. So um, I had a notation of myself somewhere about ions, I thought. But anyway... Um, this is showing us right here when elements form ions what are some of the common charges that form and you'll notice if it's in group one they form plus one in group two plus two group 17 minus one group 16 minus two minus three and of course there's going to be variations in these and exceptions to these but as a general trend you're seeing that the middle area varies a lot more um, you'll th see some things that take on multiple charges, like iron right here. Chromium actually has another common charge, 6 plus. Um, you see zinc is almost exclusively plus 2 here. Silver is plus 1. You'll need to start getting familiar with some of these common charges. I can show you at least the representative elements, how those charges come about very simply in, in Chapter 3. And we can also learn how most of these come about. But in many cases, you'll just need to start to get familiar with those because it becomes difficult to predict the charges. OK, so the last major section in this video now is the mole. Um, and I, I really want to impart to you the idea that, in fact, the mole is really no different than the dozen. And I know you've heard this before, but I'm going to stress it. And I will honestly tell you that if you understand how to do calculations with a dozen and with the idea that 12 particles represent a dozen, then you can probably do most of the calculations associated with moles and particles. There's just one little caveat we have to add. But in general, if I said to you had uh, 24 eggs, all of you can tell me that's two dozen. Why? Because you know there's 12 eggs per dozen, so 24 divided by 12 is 2. It really is no different. The only difference is 
the size of that number. It's no longer 12. A mole, and it has a different name, it's called a mole, is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. This really is the number of atoms in exactly 12 gam grams of carbon-12. It wasn't a number that was decided arbitrarily like a dozen was. It was, okay, let's figure out how many atoms are in 12 grams of carbon. That will be Avogadro's number. And the reason they chose carbon was the same reason we did before, because <coughs> it was a very well-characterized element, and we defined A and U's in terms of it, and since we knew it was, you know, carbon was 12, right, because 6 protons, 6 neutrons, we figured, okay, if you have 1 12th of that 1 AMU, carbon weighs 12 AMU's, right, carbon weighs 12 AMU's, let's just use a scaled-up version of that. Right? That's all we're doing is using 12 grams now, a scaled up version. Instead of one atom, we're going to figure out how many atoms are in 12 grams. Okay? And being able to convert between those, it, it becomes, you know, the real challenge. So it really is no different. If I say to you, even if you had a number you weren't familiar with, 625 eggs, how many dozen do you have? Well, you're going to do 12 eggs per one dozen, right? And that gives you your answer. Well, if I have 625 atoms times one mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. This number is going to be less than one, obviously. This number is going to be greater than one. But no, the math is still the same. Okay? And you can go in the reverse direction. If you have, um, you know, 3.5 moles, how many atoms do you have? Well, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per one mole. And you could have done that with eggs, right? The important thing I want you to realize here, this is something called dimensional analysis and looking at units that we did in, in Chapter 1, right? My eggs cancel out. My answer will be in dozen, right? Atoms cancel out, my answer will be in moles. Moles cancel out, my atom will be answer will be in atoms. So this is your conversion factor, and you can flip it and put it however you want, 6.02 on the bottom or the top, depending on what you're looking to calculate. Really, that comes comes to um, the major uh, idea of moles within the chapter. And with that, I will ask you to make sure as we move forward, that you get the concept of molar mass down. That's going to be that one caveat that's slightly different, and I'll explain that in detail in class. With that, I'm concluding the video.